Good morning. Thank you so much for coming to be here and be a part of this hearing. Good morning and welcome to today's oversight hearing on the CUNY School of Medicine. My name is Inez Barron and I have the distinction of being the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. Before I speak on the hearing topic, I want to address my unnumbered pre-considered resolution, which calls on the New York State Legislature to pass and the Governor to sign Assembly Bill 6811, Senate Bill 5120, an act to establish a private student loan refinance task force. The task force would bring together the state control of the Higher Education Service Corp and the private lending institutions of New York that offer student loans to study and report on ways in which these lending institutions can be incentivized to create student loan refinancing programs. Between the increasing cost of a college education and flat and declining wages, student debt has reached a record high for the 18th consecutive year. In the first quarter of 2017, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York estimated that outstanding federal and private student debt in the United States had doubled since 2009 to more than $1.4 trillion. Even more troubling is that 11% of that debt is in default. This number also includes 1.1 million student borrowers who defaulted for the first time in 2016. In New York State, the Comptroller reported that student loan debt more than doubled from 2006 to 2015 to $82 billion. And the number of student loan borrowers increased to 2.8 million. In New York City, 16.2% of the city's consumers have an average student loan balance of $35,300. And 14% of those borrowers were at least 90 days late in the fourth quarter of 2016. In light of this astronomical debt burden, which can prevent students from completing school, becoming homeowners, qualifying for student for auto loans, starting small businesses, and saving for the future, it remains unclear how we ought to expect younger generations, and especially black and Latino youth, who have been historically disenfranchised, to be competitive in a 21st century economy. If the current administration is committed to, quote, making America great again, it would not be consistently withdrawing policy memos uh, issued by the Obama administration, which were meant to strengthen consumer protection for student loan borrowers. These actions directly disadvantage women who graduate with a pay gap and minorities who disproportionately leave school without earning a degree and suffer higher rates of unemployment than their white peers. Additionally, first-generation college students are more likely to have limited access to information and knowledge about student loans. Uninformed borrowers are susceptible, susceptible to making decisions that make it harder to repay their loans. According to the most recent census data, by 2020, 65% of all jobs will require a college degree. In New York, 69% of all jobs will require post-secondary education. Thus, equipping our high school graduates with a college degree will prepare them for the future. Additionally, data also show that individuals with higher levels of education are more likely to read to their children who are likely to attain at least the equivalent amount of education as their parents. I therefore encourage everyone here to reach out to your state representatives as well as Governor Cuomo and urge them to support Assembly Bill 6811, Senate Bill 5120. President Trump's so-called America First budget cuts billions of dollars to crucial programs for low-income students and other important supports for underserved students, which will do nothing to address the rising tuition, college access, or college graduation. We have a collective responsibility to respond at the state and local level and to work together to ensure that New York City students are afforded the opportunity to attend and graduate from college without crippling student loans. Uh, do any of my colleagues want to have comment on that pre-considered resolution? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, now to uh, the oversight topic, CUNY School of Medicine. 
Building on the strong record of City College's Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education, the CUNY School of Medicine's mission is to recruit and educate highly skilled medical practitioners to provide quality health services in communities that experience a shortage of primary care physicians. According to the Association of Med American Medical Colleges, AAMC, the national projected shortfall for physicians will be between 7,300 and 41,100 by 2030. The demand for physicians will only continue to increase because within that same time period, the United States population is estimated to grow from 321 million to 359 million. One of the Key reasons why the supply of physicians has not kept up with the demand is because many medical students are choosing to specialize as opposed to becoming primary care physicians. Many students make this choice based on their student loans, which average $180,000. The national average, the average national income of a primary care physician is less than $210,000. $210, while incomes for certain specializations are well over $380,000. However, because CUNY medical students will be graduating with lower student loans, they will have greater flexibility in choosing to become primary care physicians. Medical schools have not done a good job in aggressively recruiting students of color. Nationally, the Association of American Medical Colleges indicates that black women account for only 2% of all physicians. For black males, that number is even more distressing because only 515 students matriculated medical schools across the country in 2014, or 27 fewer black men than in 1978. Additionally, despite a 243% increase in the Latino population from 1980 to 2010, the number of Latino doctors has decreased by 22%. And I also want to, as we're talking about his history, want to cite Dr. Susan Smith McKinney, who was the first female African American to graduate in New York State. She graduated in 1867 from the New, from New York Medical College for Women, and she was the valedictorian of her class, just so that you know the caliber of people that we're talking about. And we also want to cite perhaps more commonly known black doctors as Dr. Hale Williams, Dr. Charles Drew, Dr. Ernest Everett Just. So we have a history of having significant black doctors. These developments are extremely disappointing because minority physicians are more likely than their white counterparts to work in underserved minority communities. Increasing diversity is an important step towards enhancing cultural and linguistic competent care, which utilizes the knowledge, skills, and attitudes required to bridge ethnic, cultural, and linguistic gaps between patients and physicians. According to the American Association of Medical Colleges, the average cost of a four-year medical school tuition is nearly $230,000, Whereas at the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education, tuition is about a tenth of that. Tuition for the bachelor's portion of the biomedical education program is consistent with full-time enrollment at City College at $3,165 per semester for New York State residents and $560 per credit for non-resident students. For the Doctor of Medicine in Medical Education, the proposed tuition is $19,000 per semester for resident students and $31,630 per semester for non-resident students, which is consistent with the rate charged by the State University of New York System for its medical school. We do want to note, however, that in Cuba, if you wanted to go to medical school, it would be free. During today's hearing, I'm interested in an overview of the first year of the new CUNY School of Medicine, as well as its recruitment efforts, especially with regard to attracting underrepresented minorities. I would also like to receive a demographic breakdown, breakdown of the inaugural class, as well as the faculty and advisors. 
Additionally, I am interested in learning more about the school's medical curriculum, programs available to assist students in navigating their coursework, including information on the school's efforts to maintain diversity and inclusion. I would also like to know the status of the campaign to raise $20 million in scholarships to provide the inaugural class with interest-free loans. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues on the committee who are here present, Councilmember Vaca, Councilmember Rodriguez. Also, I'd like to thank uh, M. Indigo Washington, my Director of Legislation, Joy Simmons, my Chief of Staff, and CUNY Liaison, Kiru Jikiru, Kiru Jichiru, Council, com uh, Committee Council, Chloe Rivera, the Committee's Policy Analyst, and Jessica Ackerman, the Committee's Finance Analyst. Now, in accordance with the rules of the Council, I'll ask my Council to administer the oath, and we're going to call the first panel. We're going to have the Vice Chancellor, Vita Rabinowitz from Central Administration, Dean Maurizio Trevisan, CUNY Medical School, and Mr. Stephen Liston, a student at CUNY's Medical School. If you would come forward, please. Thank you. Have a seat right there. Thank you. Now we have full lighting. Thank you. Uh, please raise your right hand. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to the council members' questions? Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, excuse me. Just um, turn on the mic, please. The light should be on. Yes. Okay. A little, little Good. closer. Better. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Barron, and and. Uh, Higher Education Committee of the City Council. Before delivering the Chancellor's remarks regarding the CUNY School of Medicine, I want to convey his and my profound gratitude to the Council, to this committee, and especially to Chairperson Barron and Council Member Vaca for your most generous support of CUNY's remediation reform effort in the city approved budget. Oh, sorry. Council Chair Barron, again, Councilman Vaca, committee members, please know that your allocation is going to make a critical difference in our ability to accelerate our implementation efforts. And I look forward to sharing with you our progress in improving remedial outcomes, reducing achievement gaps, and raising graduation rates at CUNY. I also want to thank you, Chair Barron, and members of the committee for this opportunity, very much appreciated, to discuss the new CUNY School of Medicine and the extremely important mission it is fulfilling for the people of New York. I am Vita Rabinowitz, CUNY's Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost. And I am here today speaking on behalf of Chancellor Milliken, who was unable to appear in person because of health issues that I am delighted to report are improving. I will be re reading his prepared testimony, but the medical school and its important work are priorities for him, for me, and for the entire university. So I am pleased to be here to have the opportunity to be with Dean Maurizio Trevisan, uh, one of our students, Stefan Leston, and the several other students from CUNY Med who have come here today, as well as representatives of our highly valued partner, the St. Barnabas um, Healthcare System, uh, who can help provide the overview that you want and answer any questions you may have. The mission of the CUNY School of Medicine is not just vital to our city. It is intimately connected with the university's overall mission and our new strategic vision. As chancellor, I made the opening of our new medical school one of my highest priorities. And it is very meaningful to me that our partners have joined us in making it a reality. 
It is essential that CUNY continue its decades of hard work in creating opportunities for medical education to students from underrepresented groups and make quality health care available to the underserved areas of our city. The school is intrinsically collaborative, an important objective in our strategic framework. It is deeply connected to significant needs of our city since the school's fundamental aims involve increasing the diversity in the medical field, producing badly needed primary care physicians where there is a serious, serious shortage in the city, and bringing quality health care to underserved communities, an ongoing problem that our school addresses in innovative ways. That is why I believe that the medical school speaks volumes about who we are at CUNY and the many ways we contribute to making New York prosperous and exciting while providing exceptional opportunities to our students. As you stated, Chair Barron, originally the program was founded decades ago in 1973 as the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education. For promising young students, Sophie Davis provided a five-year program that gave students a Bachelor of Science degree and then the first two years of medical school focused on basic science education, stopping short of the following two years which include intensive clinical education. The students then went on to complete their medical degrees at one of a number of other medical schools with which CUNY had built strong relationships. We enjoyed great success for many years with that model, and Dean Trevisan will highlight some of these successes shortly. As proud as we are of our results over these many years, the world changed and we needed to adapt to ensure that our mission and our contributions could be sustained for our students and our communities. For a variety of reasons, the slots for the final two years of medical training were disappearing. And it was growing increasingly difficult to place Sophie Davis students in appropriate schools to complete their degrees. In addition, some schools were altering their teaching models by introducing more and more clinical training into the first two years of medical school, creating further challenges for our approach. Our staff was able to assess the issues and identify what became an excellent solution that we believe will continue to serve New Yorkers well for decades to come. We formed a partnership with the St. Barnabas Health System in the South Bronx as our teaching partner and the first class commenced in 2016. We appreciate very much the substantial support we received from the governor and the state, as well as from the city council and the city. Our new program covers seven years, and we continue to recruit directly from high school. Our director of admissions is in the audience today. We believe that this is an excellent track for students passionate about building careers in medicine in New York City. We work closely with many high schools in the area to identify good candidates and make students aware of the opportunity that the CUNY Medical School provides to highly motivated students. We are delighted with the response from applicants and the makeup of our classes. At this time, 62% of our enrolled students are females and 38% males. About half of the entering class is from underrepresented minorities. 59% are the sons and daughters of immigrants and 11% are immigrants themselves for a total of 70%. You could hardly find anywhere in the nation a group better positioned to understand and contribute to the underserved parts of our city. More importantly, you could hardly find a group more representative of the promise of this city's and this nation's future. So thank you again for your interest in the CUNY Medical School, for your support, and we look forward to learning how we can improve and how 
we can be responsive to the city's interest. Thank you, Chairwoman Barron. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you, Chairperson Barron and members of the committee for the opportunity to discuss the important developments of the CUNY School of Medicine and the impact that it has on our community. I am Maurizio Trevis and the Dean of this medical school located in Harlem. I myself live in Harlem. I want first of all to take this opportunity to thank the City Council for your support for CUNY and the School of Medicine throughout the years. As uh, Vice Chancellor Rabinowitz indicated, the challenge that we were facing uh, re required us to rethink the school. And now we have been approved by the state to grant the MD degree and have received preliminary accreditation by the accrediting body of medical school, the Liaison Committee on Medical Education in June 2015. We are excited again to have a strong committed partnership with St. Barnabas Health System, the medical director of the hospital and the chair of medicine are here to support the testimony and to speak if you have any specific questions about the association. As the chairperson Barron indicated, our mission has remained unchanged over the years to provide access to medical education to talented youth from social, ethnic, and racial backgrounds historically underrepresented in medicine, and to develop physicians committed to practice in underserved community with a special emphasis on primary care. Financial aid and scholarships. Our BSMD students now pay the CUNY undergraduate tuition, as, the, as Chairperson Barron said, for the first three years, and then the $38,000 a year for the medical school year, years four to seven. Currently, during the college years, one to three, most of the students, 80%, receive financial support in the form of need-based federal and state aid, merit-based scholarship, or both. Annually, we provide, the school provides more than a, $1 million in scholarships and fellowships every year to our students. Approximately seven to 800,000 is provided during the college years and about 300,000 is provided during the medical school years. A new service-based scholarship will be made available next year for eight students per class in the medical school years that will cover 50% of the annual tuition cost of a total of $608,000 per year when fully implemented. We realize that while the School of Medicine has the least expensive tuition of all medical schools in the state, the tuition burden is high, especially for the type of students we recruit. And we work continuously and diligently to find opportunities to establish scholarship for our students throughout our, our development office. I will briefly talk about the recruitment now. And the, the entry to the seven-year BSMD program is directly from high school. Recruitment of applicants to the school combines vigilant attention to area high schools, routine participation in various regional and school-based college fair, long-standing partnerships with various enrichment programs, and most recently, the initiation of our own pipeline program. The Office of Admissions staff and many current students in the school are involved in these efforts. In addition to this traditional recruitment effort, we have started a series of pipeline programs in the school. The Sophie Davis Health Profession Mentorship Program is, uh, is focusing on providing high school students the uh, impetus and the knowledge uh, to, to select a, a health career, uh, and it's focusing mostly on underrepresented in the uh, communities who are uh, underrepresented in the health profession. Currently, 30% 30 30 of the participants are Hispanics, 33% black and African American, and two-thirds of the participants in the pipeline program are from economically disadvantaged high schools. The second pipeline program is the Growing Our Own Doctor, or God Projects, Good Projects, <coughs> funded this year in 2016 by the West Harlem Development Corporation, and is a collaboration between the School of Medicine and the Hay Philip Randolph High School. Finally, we have the Health Professions Recruitment Exposure Program uh, that is run since 2015 completely by our students. They go to, to the high school to expose the, to the students, inspire, recruit, and mentoring uh, minority high school students who are interested in medicine, science, or research. The admission process is a very competitive one. Recruitment activity result in an applicant pool of slightly more than 1,000 applicants. This year, we had about we had 1,228. 
uh, and we, re we recruit approximately 90 students. About 25% of the applicant pool is interviewed following a thorough review of application, including academics, school activities, and community service. Invited applicants receive three interviews, one from a current student and two from faculty or staff of the school, including one with a member of the admissions committee. The admission committee ranks applicants based on the whole file review and presentation by the interviewer to the full committee. This is a this holistic approach that we use closely follow the recommendation from the Association of American Medical Colleges. We continue to be successful in our mission of enrolling students for communities that are underrepresented in the medical field. As Vice Chancellor Rabinowitz uh, indicated, 62% of our enrolled students are female in the first class, and I can tell you that this year, the students center in the first year, the, the percentage of women is even higher because it's 67%. 50% uh, of our entering class in the medical school comes from tra groups traditionally represented in medicine, but 30% are African, African Americans or black, and about 20% are Latinos, Hispanics. And uh, seven, as uh, Vice Chancellor Rabinov said, 70% of our students are either migrant themselves or sons of daughters of migrants. The table pro provides the breakdown in, uh, in ethnicity in more detail. Our curriculum is particularly uh, relevant to, the ability, to our ability to inspire students to pursue uh, a career in primary care and to be conscious of the social forces that determine the health of, of, of the students. While they pursue art education during the college years of the program, our students begin to learn the fundamental sciences of the medical curriculum and are exposed to an extensive population health and community-oriented primary care curriculum we great emphasis on the societal forces that shape the health of our communities, the social determinants of health, and the principles of, of health equity. I can easily say that this is most likely the most extensive program in the country uh, about focusing on this kind of issues in the medical school. The, the School of Medicine has an extensive support system for our students that spans from academic support to advising mentoring, and support of their psychological and social well-being. The current financial resources for the medical school are comprised of several sources. We are currently spending approximately $10 million to upgrade our facilities, and these funds include $3 million from the city council, in addition to the state funding. And I want to take this opportunity to express again my deepest appre appreciation and gratitude for the generosity of the council in supporting our our capital facilities improvement. In terms of the current operating budget, the academic year 2016-17, the sources are 11, approximately $11 million in tax levy state funding, that is the, basically the transfer from the old Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education to the CUNY School of Medicine. In addition, we have 2.8 million from CUNY and tuition revenues of 2.6 million from the MD program, uh, because we have only one class. At the time of full enrollment in the program in 2018, the yearly resources generated by the tuition of the four medical school per year will be approximately $10.5 million, and approximately $1.4 million in the physician assistant program. So the table that you have in my written testimony highlights that the, the total budget at full enrollment in 2019 will be approximately $26 million. Uh, as, as, um, uh, Vice Chancellor Rabinowitz indicated, we are very proud of the fact that our beginning of the new medical school has remained on track with the success and the achievement of the old Sophie Davis program. And in fact, I would like to just report some of the uh, statistics with regard to our, gra our more than 2,000 graduates that, that have been graduated from medical school since the beginning of the program. For the, la the, the percentage of graduates in the last 20 years who are underrepresented minorities, 35%, approximately 60% have their New York State license. This compares to uh, um, usually a much lower, much lower rate for people because there is a lot of migration out of the state after medical school. 40, 40, almost 41% are primary care physicians. This compares to a to national average about 30%. Uh, over half of the American Americans, 52.3, and Latino, 51%, graduate chose primary care and su supports the statement of Chairperson Barron that students from minorities background 
tend to more frequently select primary care as their, as their, as their career. And finally, 26% uh, of our graduates practice in health professional shortage areas, medically underserved area, population designed by HRSA as having too few primary care providers, high infant mortality, high poverty, and or high elderly population. This 26% compares to uh, about 14% in New York State uh, that work in the health professional area. So our, our, our graduates almost twice as much as the rest of the, uh, of the uh, graduates from other medical school. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you about our unbelievably special school, and I'll be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you. Next panelist. Just making sure it's on. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairperson Barron, Chairperson Barron, and members of the committee. I'd like to thank you guys for having me today give my personal testimony about Sophie Davis. I'd like to briefly share uh, a story about myself prior to me starting my testimony uh, because I feel like for you to truly appreciate where you're heading, you have to, take, you have to look back and see where you started from. Um, as a kid growing up, my mother as an immigrant always let me know that she came here to this country to give me the opportunities that she never had. Excuse me, if you could put your name into the record, please give us your name. Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Stefan Leston. Uh, I'll, start, I'll start over. Uh, my name is Stefan Leston, and as a kid growing up, my mother, as an immigrant, would always let me know that she came to this country to give me the opportunities that she never had. She told me that education is the one thing that nobody can ever take away from you. And she told me that she was not a celebrity and could not give me all the things celebrities could, but the one thing that she can guarantee me was that I was going to get a good, edu a good education. That being said, Prior to starting my senior year of high school, my mother unexpectedly lost her job. And that being said, she was unable to keep up with the tuition of my school at the time. And there we go. I was going to be losing the very education that I was told that I wouldn't be able to lose. But with a stroke of luck and a generous donor, I was able to receive a full scholarship for my senior year of high school. And when I met with the donor, he told me that he had heard about my story of wanting to become a doctor and let me know that he saw himself in me and told me that he's giving me a scholarship because he wants me to be somebody that does something good in the world. Fast forward, fast forwarding five years from then, I can officially say that I am now a graduate of the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education, and in two years, I'm on track to receiving my medical degree from New York Medical College. However, while I was in Sophie, I often found myself asking this question, what are you fighting for? In our respective lives, we are driven by the sense of purpose in order to fuel a desire to accomplish the wonderful and uncertain goals we assign ourselves. This drive is either encouraged or deterred by the hardships we encounter. Exposure to the harsh reality of being the eldest child raised by a single mother of two and enduring hardships such as her loss of employment have allowed me to comprehend the deterring forces of success in underrepresented neighborhoods. However, the hardships I encountered are not uncommon within youth minority populations. Fortunately, my strong support system has not only helped me overcome the mounting obstacles in my life, but also intensified my passion to become a physician. Thus, the desire to support, educate, and heal the upcoming generation, despite the stereotypical label of society, became ingrained within my mind. Prior to my acceptance into Sophie Davis, I remember being told discouraging phrases such as, you won't get in, you aren't smart enough, why didn't you apply to easier schools? Which at the time I believed were true. In hindsight, I now see that minority students are often the most susceptible to these statements due to the many socio-environmental factors that prevent them from achieving academic excellence. I can attest that without the support of many faculty members and my fellow classmates, that I would not have been able to complete this program. During my time here, I was able to participate in support groups such as Black Male Initiative, otherwise known as BMI, which was designed to increase the retention rates of black males within the Sophie Davis, Sophie Davis program and was led by Mr. Gerald Erves. BMI consisted of biweekly meetings, which included one-on-one -on -one mentorship with both upperclassmen and alumni, open group discussions, on academic techniques, internships, jobs, and research opportunities. Through Sophie Davis and BMI, 
I was able to work with award-winning scientists at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, researching a diverse array of fields, ranging from advanced brain tumors to even studying the effects of marital status on the cardiovascular health of immigrant taxi cab drivers. And I was even allowed to present my work at national scientific conferences in both Texas and Florida. My entrance into Sophie Davis has not only granted me, has not only granted me an ac access to a career in medicine, but also serves as a platform for me to inspire and motivate a younger generation. My interactions while working with the youth, the youth in Harlem Health Centers allowed me to witness the complexities of medicine and fully comprehend that it is a multifaceted topic that weaves together clinical knowledge and social understanding in support of a patient's voice. Growing up in similar backgrounds as these children, I continuously see that mentorship played a vital role in my success up until this point. To pay it forward, I desired to make a positive educational change within my community. As Vice President of Student National Medical Association, SNMA, I led the AP Randolph High School Mentoring Program to establish a center for change, encouraging students, encouraging more students to, in pursue, encouraging more students to attend college in pursuit of their dreams. I forged a lasting bond with my mentee, a disadvantaged young man like myself, by relating to his personal life and transforming his shortcomings into tools of motivation. As an external tool, I was able to internalize problems of youth and motivate them. When invited back to AP Randolph High School for their, as the keynote speaker to their Gateway to Medicine induction ceremony, I was discovered that my mentee was awarded a full scholarship to Princeton University. My ability to help one student achieve his dreams of going to college sparked a passion to mentor others. In addition, I was given the opportunity to lead Sophie Davis's first health, health professions mentorship pipeline program. This two-year mentoring program was designed to introduce minority high school students across the New York City area to health profession careers. In light of this program, our pipeline graduating class has seven out of the 30 students attending Sophie Davis in the fall, and the others will pursue health careers at schools such as Brown University, Penn State, Fordham University, SUNY Albany, and Macaulay's Honors Programs at both Hunter and Brooklyn College. But by far, my favorite aspect of being a Sophie Davis student was being surrounded by such inspirational peers. Behind the scenes, many of my classmates de dealt with both personal and familial illnesses, language barriers, and financial crises, but still managed to make it to class every day and excel while keeping a smile on their faces. I will forever be grateful for Sophie Davis for nurturing us into not only physicians who are academically brilliant, but also wholesome, compassionate, empathetic, and culturally competent individuals. We were constantly taught to be our patients' advocates and become doctors who do not sit idly in the face of health and social injustice, but take action. Examples of this include last year's BMI Flint Water Crisis Benefit Dinner, in which we raised approximately $4,000 to provide fresh water, supplies, and goods to those affected in Flint, Michigan, as well as my many classmates who traveled to Ghana to provide medical assistance free of charge to local villages. My peers serve as constant reminders that there is no limit to our potential in redefining the face of medicine. My enlightening experiences with patients, peers, faculty, and research while at Sophie Davis allowed me to see the importance of viewing patients holistically. As a future physician, I will view patients beyond the scope of their physical disease by listening to their stories and supporting them on their journey to improvement. I intend to unite my two greatest passions, medicine and education, to bring healing to others. Thus, my question is finally answered. I fight to help others realize their potential. I fight to serve my community, and I fight to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank the panel for their testimony. Uh, this is an exciting time because this is, in fact, an analysis or an evaluation of what we've done in this first year. So I've uh, got lots of questions, and I'm sure my colleagues do as well. In, in your testimony, uh, Dean Trevisan, you said that there's 49% that is the underrepresented, that includes underrepresented minorities. Can you give me the breakdown of how many are black, how many Latino? They're black or, uh, I'm uh, talking to the mic, please. Sorry, 30% approximately are blacks or African American and about 20% Latinos or Hispanics. Okay, okay, good. There is, there is a little bit of, um, 
Yeah, you know, some, some, some of the kids right, reported both Hispanic and, and, and uh, black. So it's. Uh, okay, I see that. And uh, for the students that are in your entering class, this freshman, the uh, inaugural class, are they all, what's the majority or what's the percentage of those who are continuing from Sophie Davis as opposed to those who may have come in? They will all continue with Sophie They're Davis. all continuing. So all of these stu uh, students are from the Sophie Davis. Going forward, is that going to also be the Look, case? We'll, we'll always be a, a, a BSMD program seven years. And the reason why we do that, because as I indicated, in, in, in many medical schools, the curriculum is four years, so there is a very, there is a huge competition among topics. So if I want to spend time teaching you how to be socially relevant to the individual, I, I need to compete with genetics, biochemistry. Mm -hmm. Because we have the seven year, we uh, use the, the three years of college to in, intertwine in the three years of college all, a lot of the population and social factors. It's, it's not a very, uh, in most of the countries in the world, uh, kids go to medical school after high school and, right. and do a six or seven year program. So this is not, is not, uh, so to, to me, the secret of, of our success is due to the fact that we have the ability to uh, incorporate in our teaching a day, for seven years all this concept. So in order to be uh, a participant, you have to come in at the beginning. Yes. You cannot come in midway. You won't I, have no, any transfer students coming in. Cannot be high school in. graduate or be a first year college student with uh, no more than one semester or coursework. Okay. So it's only those who have come in through Sophie Davis. No one else can be able no one, to no enter at another point. Okay, that I needed to understand that. So then we need to look at the students who are admitted to the Sophie Davis program. Correct. And uh, part of my briefing indicated that they needed to have, I think, an 85 average in chemistry and biology and uh, other science courses and math courses as well. In your selection criteria, what factor does ethnicity play? When you finally selected the 70 students, well, yeah. when you finally selected the students in any entering class, how does ethnicity, how does the fact that someone is black or Latino factor into all of the other criteria that's used to select your students? So quotas are, are illegal. You cannot use quotas and say we want to. Correct. So, our holistic approach focuses on the, uh, on the desire of the students to have, to become primary care physicians and to care for the community. And the, uh, the, uh, the, ultimate, the ultimate figures have demonstrated that this approach generates a fairly high level of minorities to come in. Just to give you an idea, as you said, we have 30% blacks and African American. Nationally, 6% of the of, of the students are black. So uh, it's it's we we we, we, not, we do not focus specifically or say we need to get so many blacks in or so many Latinos. But the the process is the process such and the criteria. that it really facilitates this kind of uh, this. And, and and the interesting thing to me is that if you look at the selectivity as a college. We have the selectivity slightly lower than the MIT. It's a very uh, highly selective program. Mm -hmm. And th our data show that you can be selective and still have a very diverse class. Mm -hmm. that you, don't have to, you don't have to become monochromatic in order to have, mm -hmm. to have top class. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the faculty, are, are you anticipating uh, an increase in how many more faculty persons do you anticipate you're going to need as you're we, extending this? We are years? in the process of, I believe, uh, <coughs> recruiting an additional 30 faculty in the next four or five years. 30 positions? 30, roughly, yeah. Okay. And presently, how many faculty do you have in the program? I have the data here. Okay. Okay. Oops. Oh, wait, here we go. No, this is graduating class. 
Here we go. Thank you. For full-time faculty, we have 46 full-time faculty, we have 57 full-time staff, and we have nine senior administrators, deans and associate deans. Do you have any part-time? Uh, we have adjuncts, yes, that okay. come to help us with the uh, with lecturing. For instance, we have, in addition to the to the uh, St. Barnabas physicians who come in to teach the clinical correlates in the first year, we may have some other clinicians who come and talk about nephrology that come, talks about the kidney. And I don't really have a, a clear figures of the number of adjuncts that we have. Priscilla? So the adjuncts are basically clinicians uh, in the field? It's, who are it's, it's in? mostly practitioners, yes. Mm -hmm. It can be, can be, for instance, an health behavior scientist or a psychologist or uh, some, it's, it's mostly practitioners. And what is the ratio uh, for the B, for the uh, portion of the program that's the BSMD? What's the, the ratio? Full time faculty. No, what's the ratio of yes yeah, students? Full time faculty. faculty the to students. The full the full time faculty is fifty six fifty six percent female. That's the breakdown for. That's what you were asking for. Sorry. The ratio of how many students does each faculty uh, member have responsibility for? If we were to break it down yeah. and divide the number, so the of ratio students. we have forty six faculty and we have uh, about three hundred and fifty BSMD students. So forty six divided by three fifty. Hmm? Seven to one. About seven to one. Okay. Um, so, uh, in accor according to a New York Times article, the CUNY School of Medicine uh, was established to help mitigate the issues with regard to placing students in their clinical rotations. And I understand that the federal government had established a cap, and there weren't the number of positions that would accommodate. There are a number of challenges. Yes. One of them is the that all because of the shortage of physicians. All the medical school in this country, most of them, have increased their class size. So have our colleagues in New York. So as they increase their class size, there is pressure on them to find clerkship slots for their own students. And then the other challenge that we have is that we have a, a, a large number of clerkship slots who are uh, taken by offshore schools. There are many offshore schools who have clerkship as a fact, I, I, somebody told me, and I'm not sure it's true, that more than 50% of the clerkship slots in New York are taken by offshore schools. And that's represent a major challenge for all, the, for the, all New York medical school. So this combination has been lethal for, lethal for us. So these so-called offshore schools, uh, is, what is the financial, financial advantage that, cop, that hospitals have in accepting their students? Uh, so, uh, in gen I, belie I believe, I'm, I'm not sure, that uh, uh, offshore school pay up, up to or um, almost around $20,000 per student per year. So it's a financial incentive mm -hmm. to hospitals. They're all struggling with the financial resources. And the challenge is that when we, go, uh, when we do a clerkship according to the accreditation rules, there are very strict rules. So, yes. you, you know, yes. in, in the, the offshore school are not accredited. So there is less, there is more leeway. They're not, not accredited by the LCME. Yes. They're accredited by their own, their own thing. Mm -hmm. And so there is less leeway. So the, 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 there is this, the money that the hospital receive, it's really go to help their bottom line. Right. In terms of uh, that problem of not having uh, positions, as students were completing the Sophie Davis program, did you find that there was perhaps a gap? Did they have to wait? Yes. Did actually, they we found that this year we have... Uh, 13 or 14 students? If, For if the last few years, we have experienced years in which the students graduate from us, they are accepted in a medical school, but the medical school that accept them does not have enough clerkship slots, and therefore they have to wait a year. We put them on a on a wait in a, on a waiting list. This year, in, as the last year, we got, this is going to happen. Right, because you're going to be because now we have our own right. control. And you know, if the students have we have we have uh, 
help the student to take advantage of this year to either increase their education by pursuing a master of public health mm -hmm. or pursuing research. And, you know, so we have tried to mm -hmm. make the best out of the challenge. The students have been very creative in trying to uh, uh, use the, the extra year to actually improve their, their, their knowledge and their academic. So do you find that as they're uh, doing something in the meantime that they stay in that field or do they just do that for the year and then go back? Do you find that? Uh, for instance, many, we have five students this year that are waiting to get to down, go to downstate. Right. While they are waiting, they pursuing the MPH at the School of Public Health at downstate. So they it's just so do you continue. find that even though they may uh, do something in the meantime, they still come back? Oh, yeah, back? yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. These That's people right. are eager. These kids are eager. Okay. This, this, this does not disrupt. It doesn't deter them from it getting it back. It yeah. just adds an extra year. Okay. And then how is it that you came to partner with St. Barnabas? Because they are wonderful. <laughs> That's well, true. We, sh we have exactly the same mission. They, they care about the same thing we care, the underserved population. I had the first meeting with the former CEO of the St. Barnabas and the medical director uh, who, was the C who is the CEO now, and it was really love at first sight. Mm -hmm. we, uh, it's, uh, it's really an unbelievable opportunity for us. So as the, as the CUNY School of Medicine uh, continues, all of our students in the program will be able to go to the partnership that you have with Most St. likely Barnabas. not all of them. We have a, we have a, we have a, uh, already uh, have a relationship with some of the HHC hospital, uh, uh, in, in particular Harlem Hospital, who will who will be able to take some students. So we are working to make sure that all the students have. There are certain there are there are certain clerkships who are a challenge for everybody in New York because there are not that many. One of them is family medicine, for instance. There are many so. So all students will have a placement, if not at St. Barnabas, somewhere at least else. okay, somewhere else. And can you describe the partnership with St. Barnabas in a little more detail, or will that panel come and give us further details exactly how that's going to work? So the, 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 just to give you an, an idea that uh, when we had the LCME, the accreditation visit, and we estimated the contribution that St. Barnabas was providing to the school, it was on the excess of $6 million. So $6 million that is the time that these physicians in St. Barnabas take to teach our students for which we do not pay, and that St. Barnabas contributes to this. So it's, 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 it's substantial uh, and generous commitment on the part of the hospital. Okay. For instance, um, Dr. Ed Telzak, who is the chair of medicine at St. Barnabas, is actually the chair of the clinical medicine department in the medical school. So he's, he's not only the chair of medicine at the hospital, he's even the, cha the academic chair of the, uh, the clinical medicine department in the medical school. He participates through all the meetings, the life, the, the faculty at St. Barnabas get appointed. CUNY created a special title for, for, the, uh, for them is affiliated title so they can go through the rank of assistant professor, associate professor, full professor. They are, and they, are, they participate to the, to, the, to the life of the school as, as in, in fact, we just had uh, Friday, we had the nice retreat where we discuss all the opportunity for collaboration in research, in education, and uh, it was really, a, it's a blossoming relationship. What are the graduation uh, retention rates at the Sophie Davis School? What do, how do we uh, calculate so students who? Historically, yeah. if you look at when we take the student the first year to when they graduated from the old Sophie Davis program. Right. So well, let, me, let me tell you say that of the people that graduate from Sophie Davis over the last 40 years, 96% of the graduates end up with a medical license. So basically everybody. But before, by, by the time we take the students in the first year and the graduation of five, we lose oh. about 20 to 25, 25% of the kids. And we lose them for a number of reasons. Uh, some of them realize that they don't want to be doctor, that what really was, this was the dream of their parents and not their dream. Some of them have significant, fina significant social challenges. For instance, we had uh, one alumnus who actually graduated who was homeless during, during the time of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Sophie Davis program. We have a students, I remember talking to one student who 
she's from, she was from Nigeria, and all of a sudden, the family from Nigeria decided that she needed to take care of, of her two youngest daughters. And so they shipped them here. So, so she was here alone in New York with two youngest daughters, and then, you know, she was trying to work full time to, to, to support herself, got, come to school, be a mother. These are challenges that re are not the traditional challenges that medical students face. And uh, the other one is that uh, they just f uh, don't have the ability to, to meet with the, with the uh, requirement of the academic. The academic work is fairly, as a student can attest, they work very hard. And some of the students may come in, see, this is my personal belief. It's, e it's easy to be at the top of the class in high school. You, the only thing you need to do is be smart. But once, once you come in and everybody's smart as you are, you need discipline in studying, you need s systematic approach to study, and some of the students don't have the ability to deal with that. Um, if you could give me the information as to the ethnic, uh, the ethnic data in terms of the graduation, I would appreciate that. We have and in terms of the, school, the students that do come into your program, do you find that there's a concentration of high schools that are the ones that feed into your program? And what are those high schools? Can I ask? Uh, yes, anyone who's admission? coming up, you can call the person and we'll have the yeah. uh, council. If you could just come up, there's a chair on the end, you can pull yourself up. Vice President, there's a chair on the end for you so that you could still be here. Thank you. If you would uh, Hello. please raise your right hand, the raise council will have you. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council members' questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Give us your name and. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Baron. My name is Christopher Wanyonyi, and I'm the Director of Admissions at Sophie Davis. So I will tell you a little bit about how we recruit students. Um, we do look, we do look at the high schools in New York City, particularly the five boroughs, Westchester and Long Island, and we try to identify schools that have a good representation of all races. And we try to recruit from those schools. Um, we try to recruit from schools that have a good proportion of um, first generation students. And as you are aware, we have had a lot of uh, new schools that have been coming up. So every year we select five to 10 new high schools and we try to visit them. So that's the first part. And over time, we have established uh, several schools that are diverse enough to provide us with all kinds of students, we have a good diversity of all students. So those become our feeder schools, uh, schools like St. Francis Prep. Uh, we have uh, public schools in New York City uh, that become our feeder schools. And as it was mentioned earlier, we ask then students from those schools to go back and to help us to recruit. Uh, secondly, we go to college fairs uh, that are theme-oriented, like the Latino College Fair, uh, we participate in Harlem Week, for example. Uh, we have a table there. Um, we do participate in other um, ethnic uh, groups uh, for recruitment. And thirdly, we go to community centers, churches, um, any community organization that has a meeting where we meet with parents or, or students. And that's how we focus our recruitment. So do you find that there are particular high schools that repeatedly uh, offer students that you select to participate in your, in your program? Yes, we do. And which are those high schools? We have, for example, the, I mentioned St. Francis, Francis Prep. Prep right. uh, we have uh, Medgar Evers High School, uh, which is in uh, Brooklyn. Um, we have the um, Philip, A. Philip Randolph High School, which is right on campus. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, yes, Brooklyn Tech is one of the best feeder schools among the selective schools because of the diversity of the, the student body. 
Um, we have schools in Queens like um, uh, Saint, uh, not St. Saint Francis Prep, uh, Francis Lewis High School, mm -hmm. um, Benjamin Cardozo High School, and um, which are the schools in, in Long Island. We have schools like Baldwin um, that will provide students that are, are very diverse. Okay, um, I certainly know that <clears throat> the population at um, Mega Evers High School has a large ethnic population that is black, as does A. Philip Randolph. Brooklyn Tech, unfortunately, one of those elite schools which has a very low number mm -hmm. of black and Latinos, and it's ever decre it's continually decreasing. Yes. So um, we do have some issues about uh, the student selection process for those so-called elite schools, and I do have uh, a bill that I've introduced that says we need to look at multiple criteria as we select students for our so-called elite high schools, and we're hoping to move that forward. But I do thank you for the listing of those schools. I think it's important so that people will know, even as they're selecting their high schools, that there are certain schools that have a greater percentage of their students that are accepted into this program, if in fact that's a part of what, um, if, that, if that's the area that a child wants to go to. Thank you so much. Um, if we need to have you come back, yes. we'll gladly have you come back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, we do have questions about students that you enroll. What provisions are there for students to be enrolled in your program who may have some disabilities? So, uh, we... Is uh, your mic on? Oh, sorry. Uh, we, uh, we work very closely with the Disability Office of City College to try to accommodate Oh, in, in fact, as of now, we're doing a study. As you said, as I said, we're spending $10 million to rehab our building. Right. And right. one of the things that we are doing, we're doing a study to see what are the challenges that we have in terms of ac access to certain, the class, certain classes and offices so that we can provide accessibility for all uh, students. Uh, for instance, we have uh, currently uh, uh, students with narcolepsy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we give him more time, and we have somebody there who mm -hmm. touches him so that, uh, and is working very well. So we, we, we work with all the students to, 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 to uh, support them. Can you speak to us about the relationship between the physician's assistant program and the Sophie Davis program, and yeah. how, how students who perhaps may not. Uh, continue in one program can be accommodated in another? Is there a relationship? Do you help? We have, that? we have historically in the past enough, some students who have failed to proceed, well, some of the people who have failed have gone to the PA, but we cannot give them, uh, uh, they have to compete with, with the other students, so it's, they don't get a preferential treatment because one of the, one of the issues to deal with is that they have, they have a very separate identity as a program, and so PAs don't want to see as the reject of the, of the, of the medical school students. So, uh, you know, we have, uh, I don't know, three or four, I think, that do have gone, do have moved from there, but they have applied and they have competed. Actually, it's interesting you're asking this question because the PA program is more competitive than the BSMD. In the, in the, in the BSMD, we have 1,200, a thousand to twelve hundred applicants, and we uh, uh, and we admit ninety. Mm -hmm. In the PAA, they have about fifteen, sixteen hundred applicants, and they admit thirty-five. So it is more difficult. <laughs> it is more dif plus. You know, there is a big difference in age because now, for instance, our PAA is a master program. Mm -hmm. So people that and, and many people come to to the PA profession as a second second cho career choice. Mm -hmm. So there is a big difference in age between uh, an eighteen years old freshmen from Sophie Davis and and them. Okay, apart from the partnership that you have with St. Barnabas Health System uh, that allows you to award MD degrees, how does the CUNY School of Medicine differ from the Sophie Davis School? Or is it just an expansion an ex and moving So, on? if you look at the administrative structure, 
the Sophie Davis now is the undergraduate portion of the school. So the kids come from high school into the Sophie Davis program, not anymore the Sophie Davis school. And they do Sophie the Sophie Davis program. Program, okay. and they do the first three years. And then they move into the four years. And th they are both within the administrative unit of the CUNY School of Medicine. Um, CUNY's announcement of the uh, CUNY School of Medicine accreditation notes that there is a, quote, campaign underway to raise $20 million in interest-free loans for the inaugural BSMD uh, class. How far along in this campaign are you? It's a long way to go. Long way it's to a very go. Challenging, uh, challenging match because the, the, the generous alumnus who provided this match wants the $20 million come from $15 million from the outside matched by a $5 million. So the match is much smaller. It's not a one-to-one -one match. It's not a one. And in order to get the first million of the match, we need to raise $10 million. And we are about three million dollars now. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, and so, what is this twenty million dollars expected to cover in terms of tuitions and fees and other? Twenty education? million dollars would be used the, uh, to generate an, an interest-free loan. So the students who apply for they will get a free loan without interest to to cover the tuition of the thirty-eight thousand. Actually, according to the donor, the thirty-eight thousand minus the $6,500 undergraduate tuition. Okay. And um, what are the conditions under which a student will qualify for an interest-free student loan? What the, uh, criteria? The, the donor did not set any condition. Okay. Okay. So in, in your testimony, uh, you say you provide $1 million in scholarships and fellowships yeah. every year to the students approximately, on page two of your testimony, yep. approximately a total of 700000 800000 is provided during the college years of the program for the first three years. So those Correct. are the students that are in the Sophie Davis program, program. right? Um, a new service-based scholarship will be made available next year for eight students per class. So this um, $50 million, this um, Twenty million is for the inaugural class. That's, that's a completely separate issue. It's separate. Okay. So now we have the uh, eight students available per class in the medical school years that will cover fifty percent of the tuition costs. Correct. And so, where is that money designated? Okay. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but in the old model of the school, the students had to sign a commitment that in, in, in order they had to, to serve, after the, the clinical training, they had mm -hmm. to serve for two years in an underserved area of New York in mm -hmm. primary care. Well, turned out that approximately 50% of the, our graduates, as I told you, about 50% of our graduates, yes. so the 50% that decided to go into subspecialty pay back $75,000 to uh, to to the to New York State and to us basically, and so uh, we have um, this we have uh, identified six hundred thousand dollars a year from this pot that would be it's it seems to me a nice thing to see that the payment of the students who have not that fulfilled the commitment goes to in part to support the new generation of students okay. who are coming through, and there will be some there will be some some commitment attached to it. It will not be free money in the sense that uh, we are still discussing with the faculty, but there will be some, some service commitment, whether or not it's primary care or underserved area or both, that in, in order for the students to benefit from this, they have to make a commitment to serve. And so uh, you said presently the Sophie Davis School required them to do a two-year commitment, and those who did in not... In the old model. In the old model. So what does the new model say? Nothing. Because they pay full tuition for medical school, we felt that would be you know the one of the one of the thing why the state uh, paused that because they were for the first years of medical school they were paying sixty they were paying city undergraduate tuition. Now, see in the old model the mm -hmm. students paid you know in the seven <coughs> in, the, in the in the seven year model in in the first years of medical school right. four and five they were paying CUNY undergraduate tuition. Mm -hmm. And then they would go to medical school and pay the full tuition of medical school. In the old model, they pay medic the, the medical school tuition for the full four years. 
So how then, um, I understand your selection process now tries to uh, identify students who perhaps I read in the briefing paper who have some um, community service that they've given or shown some connection to uh, social organizations. How then are we going to try to really match those students that we think will in fact continue mm -hmm. if there's no commitment for them to say that uh, if I don't this is a very I good question yeah. so let me the, the, the forces they shape the choice of profession mm -hmm. are much stronger than us right as you said yeah. and things change if, if you had if you, uh, you have a choice and say I'm gonna make hundred fifty thousand dollars as a pediatrician or I'm gonna make half a million dollars as an intervention cardiologist it's challenging so the choice has to be made based on belief. Mm -hmm. And we believe that by having such a intense exposure to what, the, what, the, what you know, we, we, we think that we, in addition to, to, <coughs> to make good physicians, we want to create, we want to make good people, great citizens who care. And so we believe that through this exposure and through the experience at St. Barnabas, the student will come to appreciate and make a choice based on appreciation. So because I believe <coughs> that the ethical or the emotional choice of, 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 of deciding to take care of the underserved and work in primary care has to be a, a, from, the, from the depth of your heart because otherwise it's impossible, an impossible competition we have. And then in terms of Remaining in New York State, I heard you in part of your testimony, I think you said something about 60%. 60% remain? Six, I have a license in New York State. They may have a, a license. You know, okay. we, 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 we get this information from the American Medical Association master file. So if somebody has a license in New York and Florida, we don't know. What kind of reciprocity exists between New York State and other states in terms of being licensed? None. None. You have to. Oh, okay. It's one of the sticky. The, the, the argument is for, just to give you an idea, the argument that is in Europe with the, with the European Community Organization, you can graduate in Italy and, and practice in Germany, in France, mm -hmm. in Bulgaria, anywhere. In the States, that's not possible. Well, you don't have to take an exam. Well, excuse me, yeah. you'd have to testify, yeah, please. To, so. Would you like to? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, in. <coughs> I believe in New York State now, with uh, Enteric being admitted to the bar with the last exam that was bar? given. No, I'm talking, yeah, I know. Thank you. Uh, in the last exam that was given for the bar exam, you automatically were credentialed in three or four other states. That's correct. That's a, that's a very recent change. That's I know a, yeah, because so the my, last daughter, exam. my daughter. <laughs> Who is a lawyer, so she did okay. the Okay, she did the last exam, so she No, did. she was the one before, so she, she did not. So she missed it. <laughs> she okay. missed it. So my daughter-in-law did the last one, yeah. so she gets that advantage. So is there any discussion about that being considered for is, the medical profession? I'm not very familiar. But do you I, think that that would be advantageous, or do you I think I personally not? think it would be advantageous. First so in, in other words, then, if someone graduated and uh, was licensed in New York State, what would be the process by which they could be licensed in other states? They wouldn't have to. What would be the process by which okay, they so could I'm be I'm going to have to ask. Okay. Would you come up and uh, we'll swear you in? Uh, please raise your right hand. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council members' questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, state your name for the record. Eric Applebaum. Okay, thank you. I'm the chief medical officer of SBH Health System. Good morning. Good morning. Um, to get licensed in another state, you have to apply um, sort of de novo. So you, you have to have your credentialing package, shows that you graduated from an accredited medical school, and then they will look at your past history of practice, uh, review, you know, all your credentials as physician, malpractice history, and mm -hmm. there's no uh, sort of reciprocity whatsoever. Holding a license, obviously, is something that they could potentially hold against you because they're going to look at that history and make sure there's no actions against that license. But to your question about whether or not it would be advantageous, you know, with today's technology, we're starting to cross the line of um, all this telemedicine. 
And so, for instance, there's plenty of hospitals that use out-of-state physicians to read, uh, for instance, uh, radiology studies. Right. And they are actually, they do have to be licensed in each state. And it gets even more complicated because the billing, just because you have a license doesn't mean you're able to bill. You have to apply for a Medicaid and Medicare number and get credentialed. So it's become very difficult. Now, you know, in popular areas uh, as New York and big urban centers, it's not a big deal. There's lots of physicians around. But when you start to talk about some of the rural areas in, uh, in the United States, it's, it's challenging to get a neurologist in, you know, Montana at 3 o'clock in the morning. So maybe if you made the licensing easy, we could have telehealth and that sort of thing flow. But right now, uh, no one is sort of bent, uh, you know, in terms of their position. I did want to make one um, a comment about the question you had about what would keep people in primary care. Because I'm a practicing primary care physician at St. Barnabas for 20 years, and I also mm -hmm. did emergency medicine, and I trained at St. Barnabas. And one of the things that I, I always knew about Sophie Davis is when their students go out in their sixth and seventh year mm -hmm. in the old program and to NYU and to some of the big fancy academic centers, you know, it, it's, it's simply excitement and they get wooed when they run into an interventional cardiologist or a fancy plastic surgeon and up on their banner they say, we just did a double transplant or just separated twins, which are all wonderful medical things that we need to do. When you come to St. Barnabas, you see people taking care of the community. And we simply don't have all the, the, the you know, that quaternary care, quaternary care, tertiary care type stuff. We're taking care of people. I have patients I've been taking care of for 20 years. Um, when we had the patient-centered medical home grant, one of the um, features we had was uh, we hired an ambulatory chief resident. Instead of doing a chief resident in medicine, we had a regular hospital one and then an ambulatory-based one. And that person sort of followed around some of our primary care physicians and naturally signed on with us and became a primary care doctor. Why? Because he had a mentor or exposure. several mentors. It's all about the exposure. Mm -hmm. It's the first person you run into. It's, and here at St. Barnabas, you're going to run into an ambulatory care division that has system-wide 250,000 primary care visits or 250,000 ambulatory visits a year, whether it's behavioral health or pediatrics or internal medicine. You know, it's not going to be fancy uh, robot medicine and, you know, I have one interventional cardiologist. I don't have 20. I don't do transplants. You know, we, we take care of diabetes and hypertension and, you know, high cholesterol and address all the social determinants of health. And, and that's what you get at SBH. And that's why I think we can keep the primary care doctors. I agree. Thank you. So the process then to be uh, licensed in another state is simply an administrative and clerical one, not simply, but it's a matter of doing the application is not any other no there's no other testing or it, 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 it's it's an onerous administration okay. it's separate from Press. the bar from what used to be the bar okay because in the bar for law you have yes. to complete it yes. so it's all over right okay thank you so much You're i appreciate welcome. thank that. you uh, this is Um, before I go to that question, uh, to our student presenter. So thank you so much. I'm always interested in, in hearing uh, from firsthand participants in programs. And you indicated that uh, you went to, I guess, a private school, high school, because you were challenged with mm -hmm. the tuition for that last year, but you were able to get that. So you came to the Sophie Davis program, and obviously you enjoyed your experience there. Why didn't, did you have the opportunity to apply to be a part of the inaugural class or were you already admitted to another program? Um, so when I did apply to Sophie Davis, like I was the year before that happened. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, that's just. Okay. Just, just how, kind of timing. Of, yeah, just timing. Yeah. Okay. If I was a year later, I would have been in the inaugural class. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to understand what that was mm -hmm. about. And then in terms of uh, back to back to the dean, um, how do you assist students once they complete or once they will be completing the school with getting residencies? Because that's the next step, right? So the residency is, is, a, is a national match. So we, are, we have uh, advisors, physicians who work with the students from throughout the period of time to try to what, – what we can do is make them ready for, you know, make sure that they do what they need to do in, in order to fulfill their dream. So we can't 
so what I'm, the advisor will work with them and say, okay, you want to be um, a surgeon, so make sure that you have the right, the right exposure. And, and if you, if let's say, if we know that the mm -hmm. residency program requires a research, so, and then so we'll work with the students to make sure that they do research or that they publish a paper. So we, we do everything that we can mm -hmm. to tailor the needs of each student to the to the uh, to the uh, residency residency program they want. Do you track students? Uh, does the Sophie Davis? Well, at that time it was a school. Did they track students after graduation, and how long do they track them? We, they, we, we 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 track them as part of the alumni. We have an alumni association with an alumni board, and so we track the students. And uh, some of them don't want to talk to us, right? But no. but but we do track them. Okay. Okay. Um. So I think you said that 60% of your students are licensed in New York. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea of how many of them are in those historically underserved communities? 26%. 26%. 26% of our graduates not are it's, it's in the testimony okay. at the bottom. And co that's compared to 14% in New York. So in, in New York, 14% of the physicians work in underserved area. And 26% of your graduates? 20% of our graduates work in... Uh, Okay, thank you so much. You've been very enlightening. I've got great uh, hopes for what will continue to be a great program and provide us with doctors who, as we say, are not just doctors but are really connected to the work that they do and have a love for the people that they serve. And uh, we thank you for this innovative approach and for understanding that you needed to do more for your graduates so that they weren't running into this bottleneck of not being able to find space. Uh, right. Thank you for the partnership that you formed and look forward to hearing about that partnership even more in the next panel. Thank you it so much. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Can I, is it appropriate for me to make a request? You can make your request, certainly. I would really would like to encourage the council to find ways to provide scholarship to, the, to these kids. Oh, that sounds Sir. wonderful to me. So if you, if, you can, if you can work on that, you know, in the sense of providing a, a, ser a service, as say you, you, you like, like the old commitment, you get the money yes. from the city, but you need to come back to the city. Right. Thank that you. would be a wonderful opportunity for our Thank community. you. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for coming. And we'll call our next panel. Uh, Jonah Kaluku from CUNY USS and Hercules Reed, also All from right. CUNY USS. I didn't, I didn't know where you were going with that question, that's why. Oh, I yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that. Yes. 
Okay, we're going to ask Council to swear you in. Um, please raise your right hand, both of you. Thank you. Um, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but your truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council members' questions? Yes. All right. Thank you. You may begin. Check, check. I'll go first. Um, good morning, honorable members of our city council. My name is Jonah Kurluku, and I recently graduated Lehman College, summa cum laude, with my bachelor's of science. I earned a earned a 3.9 GPA while, while being involved in community service, student leadership, and athletics. I'm currently completing my term as Vice Chair of Fiscal Affairs in the University Student Senate. I plan to take the MCAT Medical College Admissions Test on August, 20, um, August 19th and then apply to medical school in 2018. As you all know, the, medic the MCAT is the admissions exam for medical school and I'm looking forward to taking it. In addition to receiving high grades and a great <coughs> MCAT score, competitive medical school applicants should complete research. It would be better to be published. Shadow physicians do community service and participate in extracurricular activities. Medical schools also want students to be well-rounded. A good applicant has his or her share of experiences in other fields rather than just being deeply integrated in the scientific community. I'm happy to report to this committee that Lehman College has prepared me for medical school and the road ahead. I want to read a testimony from my friend and fellow Lehman College student leader, Zara Adamu. She will be starting her first year at Whale Cornell Medical College next month. She says, as you all may be aware, finding a medical school to call home for the next four years was a tasking process. It is imperative that a medical school possess adequate resources and facilities to train future physicians. As a former student and advocate for CUNY, I'm requesting that more attention is placed on the CUNY Medi School of Medicine. Many CUNY undergraduates and undergraduates in other universities are interested in the medical school. However, many students are also unwilling to sacrifice obtaining the best possible medical training. All I ask is that great consideration is placed on the facilities that will house future CUNY med students, the support from distinguished researchers and physicians, and most importantly, a strong hospital network to supplement their knowledge. I agree with Zara's perspective. As we add another piece to CUNY, which is already the largest urban institution of higher learning in the nation, we should make it a priority, making sure that CUNY School of Medicine receives all the resources it needs to ensure its success. We need a commitment from all the key decision makers, our legislators and administrators, our deans and professors, that physicians of the future that attend this new medical school have access to everything. I understand that CUNY is a public institution and resources are short, but New York City is among the richest cities in the world. We shouldn't have shortages in education. I remember examining a virtual specimen in one of my undergraduate courses and remember and, and thinking how much more interactive and meaningful the learning experience could have been if we had more in-class resources. As most CUNY colleges experienced in our undergraduate anatomy courses, they were online. I also remember thinking about how important it would be if we had the vast majority of our courses uh, taught by full-time faculty um, that had the time and resources to nurture our talents. The students at this CUNY School of Medicine will depend on you to give them all the resources they need to save lives. Given that consideration, I am humbly requesting that this legislative body work to do everything possible to ensure CUNY gets the funding and resources they need to make the CUNY School of Medicine a success. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next panelist. Good morning, honorable members of our city council. I would like to start off with making note that what I'm gonna be discussing today is in relation to the CUNY School of Medicine and the expansion of CUNY colleges. My name is Hercules Emil Reed and I'm ending my second term as student government president at New York City College of Technology. I'm also the current vice chair of legislative affairs for the University Student Senate. Both as a student and student leader, I have noticed the financial strain on the university and have seen its direct effects on my campus. In my position as vice chair, I got it. 
Sorry about that. Um, I have noticed the financial strain on the university and I've seen its direct effects on my campus. In my position as vice chair, I've been, a I've been to Albany on numerous occasions to advocate for things like fun more funding for capital projects, faculty, and especially the need to freeze tuition and fully fund CUNY. Due to the lack of funding on the state and city levels, CUNY has not been able to maintain its growth over the years. We, the University Student Senate, are concerned that the continuous expansion affects quality across the university system. There is a struggle to provide for the needs of today's students. The colleges don't have funding for essential needs. One of the main issues is a shortage of full-time faculty, like nurses, and other needed services. Teachers are the backbones of the education system, and a lack thereof has a very obvious and detrimental impact on the students. My mother is an educator in the New York teaching system, so I've witnessed firsthand the importance of an educator and the impact of a good one in a student's life. As a proud graduate, I attribute my large, a large part of my success to my professors. They, however, have been stretched thin and at times the quality of education has suffered. With proper funding to hire more full-time faculty, the colleges would be able to properly address this issue and ensure that high standards of education are met and maintained. Another one of the current problems is the poor infrastructure on CUNY campuses. Students are in buildings that are falling apart, elevators are breaking down, bathrooms need renovating, buildings are being overcrowded, and there's simply not enough space to offer all the classes students will need within the semester. There are leaks in buildings when it rains, and I myself have sat in classrooms where temperatures reached over 90 degrees. How can we as a system expect to maintain high quality education in these conditions? If more money was allocated toward the college's operating budget, many of these issues would be remedied. The onus of funding these things should fall on the city and the state, not the students who it seeks to educate. It is, a, it is great to have a school of medicine, and now CUNY is looking to create a school of labor relations. CUNY is being forced to raise tuition by $200 on already financial strained students to make up for needing fundings, funds. Even with free tuition now being a CUNY standard, we are still having the conversation about operating the college on the backs of students. Why? If operating costs are still a major issue, how can we expect to financially support the potential growth associated with a free tuition scholarship? Without remedying the existing issues, new ones will arise and we will run out of building space to host the growing class sizes and will inevitably continue to fall apart due to overuse. Faculty, staff, and administration administrators will be stretched even more thin and the entire infrastructure will begin to crumble. While free tuition serves as a facade for poorly operating public education system, I'm here today as an alumnus to raise awareness of the climate on CUNY campuses. I would like to encourage you to continue to be a part of the growth of this ama amazing dream machine. Its future depends on people like us who were elected to serve and represent the interests of its constituents. If funds are so tight, how then can we consider continuing to expand? If funds are available, why not put them to existing programs or underfunded projects, initiatives, and capital projects? The money that would be used to fund new colleges should be used to develop what we already have here and allow each of the 25 colleges of the City University of New York to flourish and reach its full potential. Thank you. I want to thank you for coming and for presenting testimony. It's always critical to hear from those who are directly impacted by the funding or lack thereof or uh, underfunding that affects the quality of the education that they receive at CUNY. You all know I'm a CUNY graduate, mm -hmm. so CUNY is very dear to my heart. But we understand that the state has been continually underfunding and being negligent in its responsibility to provide adequate funding for higher education, and we're going to continue to fight in that regard. And you know my position is free tuition, yes. and I don't think that uh, when you have an increase in tuition, 
uh, that is what you call free tuition. If it were free, there wouldn't be increases and there wouldn't be a cost. Correct. So uh, I'm going to be very critical of the so-called Excelsior Scholarship Program, which does not, in fact, provide additional assistance for low-income students who are overburdened by the extra costs of uh, textbooks and transportation and other fees that are associated with that. But we do thank you for your testimony, and thank we're you. going to continue to fight to make sure that we can get the resources that we need to advance education for those students who are moving on in that degree. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. There being no further testimony, we will adjourn this hearing. Thank you. <laughs>